tonight drawing scrutiny after the fires. This is a very emotional moment for our community here. A lot of people are hurting. We're in Maui as an already hit community continues its recovery efforts while asking questions and suing the power companies they say helped spur those devastating wildfires despite the official cause remaining undetermined. Plus, these cryptocurrencies were calling themselves currencies and all these guys were hawking the stuff. I was initially drawn in, but then I couldn't understand them. And I thought, this seems really sketchy. How the star of one of the biggest shows of the 2000s went from actor to crypto skeptic, predicting the fall of FTX, and now sounding the alarm in more ways than one. And... And you never felt discriminated against? I definitely did, but not because I was Asian. Because of your inherent bad personality. Exactly. It's a groundbreaking indie romantic comedy that's full of representation and helmed by a star in his own right. Randall Park joins us to talk about the story that turned into his directorial debut, Shortcomings. And good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alt in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following all of those stories and much more, including the latest development in the dramatic back and forth between ex-NFL player Michael Orr and his adopted family that inspired the film The Blind Side, plus the incredible moments 30,000 feet in the air when a pilot dies mid-flight, and just how far would you go for your pet? The extreme lengths that some are willing to go for their furry friends in tonight's prime focus. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with the horror on Maui. As the death toll surpasses 100, the desperate search for the missing carries on as these wildfires become the deadliest natural disaster in Hawaii's history. Governor Josh Green says about 35 percent of the burned area has been searched with cadaver dogs. Officials warn the death toll is expected to rise still. And we're learning tonight the first fire reported on Maui may have been caused by damaged power lines. That's according to the CEO of the power monitoring company Whisker Labs. As we see for the first time footage of what's believed to be the start of that fire, this surveillance video shows that spark, a flash and a down power line. Our Whit Johnson starts us off tonight on the island of Maui. Tonight, for the first time, we're seeing video of what could be an early trigger in the devastating Maui wildfires. You can hear a witness describe a flash that could be a tree falling on a power line. It's windy, and then there's a flash, and I think right. that's when a tree's falling on a power line. One expert saying those videos taken inland from Lahaina show the flames spreading and may be the first evidence of downed power lines igniting a fire. We've got that video of that kind of explosion, that arc flash, and we've got 10 sensors in that community that show a very sharp drop in electrical voltage at precisely that same time. Power line just went down. And early Tuesday morning in Lahaina, Shane True using a garden hose to battle a fire that he says appears to have been caused by a downed power line. That whole place was just engulfed. Oh. Authorities declaring that brush fire under control around 10 a.m., but then lost control of the flames hours later when the winds caused a flare-up to spread. By 5 p.m., Lahaina's historic front street up in flames. The utility saying they are still investigating what triggered the fire, adding the cause has not been determined. For the first time, FEMA escorting us into the heart of the devastation. This is our first trip into Lahaina to see it firsthand. What was once historic Lahaina town, now unrecognizable. People describe the flaming embers raining down from the sky and they only had a few seconds to get out. And many of them, their only escape was come right out here to the ocean and jump into the water. Rubble still smoldering, pieces of buildings, boats in the harbor, life seemingly frozen in time. 20 search dogs now on the ground, 20 more expected in the coming days. When you look around, is there ever a moment when the emotion gets to you? When I'm done. No. Uh, when, I, when I go home, it might sink in a bit, but no, I got, I got a job to do. We'll, we'll take care of it. That painstaking work and so much more to go. Whit Johnson joins us on Maui tonight. And Whit, I know that we're, there was an announcement from President Biden today. What do we know? 
Yes, Trevor, President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden plan to travel to Maui on Monday to meet with first responders and survivors. And tonight, FEMA is urging more evacuees to register for disaster assistance. They could have access to an upfront $700 payment, something to help them get started on their recovery. Trevor? We know so many need it. Whit Johnson, thank you. Next to the Georgia election interference case against former President Trump and his 18 alleged co-defendants, the district attorney there has now proposed dates for the arraignment and the trial, further complicating Trump's already busy legal calendar as he's also campaigning for re-election. And the proposed date is just one day before the biggest voting day of the primary season. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the details. With all eyes now set on Georgia, where Donald Trump and 18 alleged co-conspirators have less than 10 days now to show up to face charges, tonight Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis has now revealed when she wants the trial to begin. The DA asking the judge to set March 4th, right in the middle of the campaign and potentially conflicting with other trials. Special Counsel Jack Smith has asked a federal judge in Washington, D.C. to start that trial on January 2nd. But in Georgia, it will be different. Trump and the 18 alleged co-conspirators will likely have to show up at the county jail, where the sheriff has indicated they're ready, expected to be fingerprinted and get their mugshots taken. The sheriff saying defendants can turn themselves in at any time. The jail is open 24-7. The former president's ex-lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who famously used racketeering laws to go after mob bosses in New York, now facing 13 criminal counts in a case using the same kind of statute. Tonight, Giuliani says he's preparing to turn himself in. Well, I'll pick a day next week, try to work out the conditions of bail, because there has to be bail, I imagine. Part of the case against Giuliani includes personal attacks on two poll workers that were not true, accusing them of stealing ballots. Quite obviously, surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. Tonight, Giuliani saying he's ready to defend himself. I'm indicted for being his lawyer. I never thought I'd ever get indicted for being a lawyer. Surrendering to the sheriff at the county jail is just the first step in a process that will likely be far different from what we've seen before. In Georgia, there are cameras in court, which means Trump and the other defendants could be seen there often during a presidential campaign. And after they're booked, Trump and his co-defendants will have to appear before a judge to be arraigned and enter pleas. The district attorney today saying she expects that to happen the week of September 5th. And will Trump and the other defendants be tried together? The prosecutor already making that clear. Do I intend to try the 19 defendants in this indictment together? Yes. On social media, Trump attacking the DA and falsely claiming he won Georgia, even as Georgia's popular Republican Governor Brian Kemp says the 2020 election was not stolen. Trump lost. And Aaron joins us now. Aaron, we knew, do know today the Fulton County District Attorney said she hopes that March 4th trial date is not going to conflict with other criminal trials that the former president is facing, but there are a number of them, and you've been across all of them. Do you see any possible conflicts there? There are plenty of possible conflicts, both legal and political, Trevor. Let's start with the, the legal. The former president, as you know, faces four simultaneous separate criminal prosecutions. Already in March, he's supposed to be on trial right here in New York in the case involving hush money paid to porn actress Stormy Daniels. Then there's the political calendar. March 4th, Fonnie Willis's proposed trial date in Georgia is one day before the Super Tuesday primaries. Trevor? A lot to keep track of. Aaron Katursky, thank you. And next tonight, we're tracking severe storms across several states with damaging winds, large hail, and possible tornadoes. Of course, this comes after deadly storms hit the east overnight. Our Rob Marciano is here to time it all out for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Trevor. Yeah, the storms are firing up across the upper Midwest, right along the Canadian border, and they could bring some damaging winds to places like Duluth, maybe Rochester, Minneapolis, into Wisconsin as we progress through the after early and late evening hours. And we could see, a, as you mentioned, damaging winds and a brief tornado. The heat's the other thing that we're watching, and that's spreading uh, again and holding strong across the Pacific Northwest, where temperatures are well up and over 100 degrees in places like Portland. And this is dangerous heat for them, cooling a few degrees, but still record highs are possible. And look at this for the first time since we've been keeping records, the Gulf of Mexico average temperature, 88 degrees. That is way above average, a direct link to climate change, and not a good thing as we head into the heart of hurricane season because now our computer models are saying the western Gulf is an area we need to watch heading into next week. Uh, Trevor? Rob, while we have you, let's talk about another area that I think maybe we need to be watching, Antarctica. I'm hearing that they're in uncharted territory with how little ice there is there. Is that something we need to be paying attention to? What's going on down there? 
Absolutely, and this also has a direct link to climate change. We're in the heart of summer, they're in the heart of their winter, so that's when the ice, the sea ice around Antarctica grows, and we're looking at an area now that is 1.5 million square kilometers below the average. So that is not a good thing. We've got a couple of more months before we really basically peak, but it does look like this year is once again going to be a record low for sea ice in the Antarctic. Trevor. Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. Now to some terrifying moments in the sky after flames began shooting out of a flight causing chaos. ABC's Victor Okendo brings us this story and another emergency in the air. Keep your eyes on the right wing of that plane flying over Houston. Shortly after takeoff, flames shooting out from the engine of the Southwest jet bound for Cancun. With one engine down, they were forced to turn around, making an emergency landing at Houston's Hobby Airport Tuesday night. 307, you clear for the alley from way four approach. 307, you still have uh, one engine shut down, is that correct? The plane landing safely. The airline tonight saying the jet experienced a mechanical issue shortly after takeoff and was taken out of service for review. And in Miami, another scare in the skies. A pilot suffering a medical emergency in the middle of a LATAM Airlines flight from Miami to Santiago, Chile, Monday. There were three pilots on board when the flight diverted to Panama. The airline saying the crew tried saving the pilot's life mid-flight. Medical teams standing by when the plane landed, but the pilot died. And Victor Okendo joins us now. Victor, what's the airline saying about this tragedy? Trevor Latam said that this pilot has been with them for 25 years. They are deeply saddened. The cause of death has not been released. And tonight, the FAA says that they are investigating that Southwest flight over Houston. Trevor? All right, Victor Okendo for us. Victor, thank you. Next tonight, a major legal victory for a newspaper that was raided by local authorities over a story the paper says it never published. And one of the co-owners of that paper, a 98-year-old woman, died just one day later, and her family says it was because of the stress of that raid. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, a legal victory for this small-town Kansas newspaper after this police raid that made national headlines. Marion police reading a reporter her rights, snapping photographs, and taking away computers as they seized items from the newsroom of the Marion County record. Part of what they said was an investigation into how the paper obtained and handled documents about a local business owner. But Eric Meyer, who co-owns the paper, said they never published the article and that they were falsely accused of illegally obtaining information. Meyer says his 98-year-old mother and co-owner, whose home was also raided Friday, died on Saturday, one day after the raid, saying she was too stressed to sleep or eat. How dare they take the last day of her life and make her filled with fear and anger. But today, a local prosecutor reviewing the case saying there was insufficient evidence to support that search warrant and that all of the devices and materials seized must be returned. Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, where's this case go from here? Well, Trevor, an attorney for the newspaper says they are still considering their legal options. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation is now reviewing the actions of those authorities who carried out the raid. Trevor? All right, Alex Perez, thank you. Also tonight, a new court decision concerning a widely used abortion drug, Mifepristone, setting the stage for a battle that could go all the way to the Supreme Court. A federal appeals court has agreed Mifepristone should be more tightly regulated, deciding the FDA went too far when it approved the drug more than 20 years ago. The appeals court says for now, though, it will not restrict how women access the drug, as this does potentially go all the way up to the Supreme Court. We also have some good news tonight after doctors in New York City announced a medical breakthrough, a genetically modified animal kidney transplanted into a human recipient that is continuing to see success weeks after the procedure. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the details. Tonight, a major medical breakthrough bringing us one step closer to using animal organs in humans. Surgeons at NYU Langone announcing they have transplanted a pig kidney into a brain dead patient. And for the first time, that kidney, genetically modified to better match a human body, has functioned for more than a month without the body rejecting it. The pig kidney appears to replace all of the important tasks that the human kidney manages. The sister of that patient, 57-year-old Maurice Mo Miller, saying this groundbreaking study is what her brother would have wanted. He would be proud of the fact that in the tragedy of his death, his legacy 
will be helping many people live. The hope is that one day, pig kidneys could ease a dire shortage of organs. More than 100,000 Americans are waiting for an organ, but each year, only about a third will get one. 17 people die each day waiting. At the end of the day, um, we have to think about all the people who are dying right now because we don't have enough organs. And Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, this is a fascinating story. What's the next step here in this possible history-making process? Well, Trevor, researchers will continue to monitor the kidney for another month. Experts say this new evidence could help pave the way for future clinical trials in living patients. Trevor. I mean, the possibilities are limitless. This is unbelievable. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Well, tensions are high in Alabama as federal courts determine the legality of the state's redrawn congressional maps. ABC spoke with plaintiff Kadita Stone, who was present at the seven-hour hearing, stressing the weight of the outcome. We won't know how long it'll take, but we've learned that timing is imperative. Um, elections get poisoned by these maps the longer, you know, they remain in place. Um, you can't put toothpaste back in the tube. I think that it's we are in a very, you know, critical moment. Uh, yes, you know, both courts, you know, have agreed with us, and that says a lot because if we were to lose Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that would really, you know, be, that's, that's a ch good chunk of the Voting Rights Act. Now, after seeing evidence and hearing arguments on whether the state's new redistricting plan remedies a violation of the Voting Rights Act, the three-judge panel promises to deliver a decision soon, but has not yet specified a time. Meanwhile, in Mississippi, testimony began today in the trial of two white men who were accused of chasing down and shooting at a black FedEx delivery driver. Brandon Case and his father, Gregory Charles Case, have been charged with attempted first-degree murder, conspiracy, and shooting into the vehicle of 24-year-old to Montario Gibson, who was just dropping off a package back in January of 2022. Two men are accused of chasing Gibson out of the neighborhood, firing at least three rounds at his work van. We have an update tonight in the controversy surrounding the family and football star that inspired the movie The Blind Side. Former NFL player Michael Orr claims in a lawsuit that a husband and wife depicted in the award-winning film never actually adopted him and kept money from the movie that was rightfully his. Well, now that husband and wife say they want to end the conservatorship at the center of this dispute, here's Ariel Reshef. Tony, here's your quarterback, all right? You protect his blind side. When you look at him, you think of me. Tonight, attorneys for the Tui family, made famous in the movie The Blind Side, firing back against allegations they exploited former NFL star Michael Orr for financial gain. This was somebody they treated as a son who has made public these allegations that are just ludicrous. The family disputing Orr's claims that he recently learned he had been tricked into signing a document making them his legal conservators after they took him in when he was a homeless teenage football player. The Tui say Orr knew about the arrangement and even wrote about it in his own book years ago. Mr. Tui sold his company for $220 million. He didn't need Mr. Orr's money. The Tui's claim money from the movie was split evenly among the family and Orr, each getting $100,000, but that Orr threatened to plant a negative story about them in the press unless they paid him $15 million. We're not going to be strong on it. We haven't done anything. Uh, we're not going to be extorted. And Ariel Reshev joins us now. Ariel, I'm sure a lot of people are curious about this. Why the family? What do they say at all? Why they began this conservatorship to begin with? Right, Trevor. So through their attorneys, the family is saying that they entered this agreement in order to secure Michael Orr's college football career. Orr, of course, is now saying he wants to end that conservatorship and he wants any money that he's owed. The Tuies are also saying they're willing to drop the conservatorship at any time. Trevor. Okay, Ariel Resha for us. Ariel, thank you. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime. We're going to talk to director Randall Park about the comedy drama shortcomings that he directed. But next, the lengths that one man went to in order to save the life of his friendly feline. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. 
from Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. How far would you go to save your pet's life? According to a new study by the Pew Research Center, more than half of pet owners not only consider their pets to be a part of their family, but say they are as much a part of their family as a human member. And as veterinary medicine advances, there are more options on the table to help out our furry loved ones, but those options can be extremely expensive. Like a kidney transplant for cats, that's a surgery that could cost upwards of $20,000. For some, the cost is well worth it. Our Jacqueline Lee met with a cat dad who opted for that pricey procedure. She goes inside the university on the cutting edge of pet medicine. The bond between a pet and an owner is like no other. What do you got? Come on. And while there may not exactly be two-way conversations, there's no question that a deep love is there. Here in Franklin, Tennessee, three friendly felines are cuddling up with their owner, Greg Norwicki, Charlie, Tucker, and Slash. Their journey hasn't been without its challenges. Five years ago, Tucker experienced kidney failure. Can you kind of explain what Tucker's been through? Tucker's been through a lot. Routine blood work and his kidney value, the creatinine level and his BUM levels were slightly elevated. Three months went by, six months went by, they continued to elevate. So Dr. Grace introduced the concept of a kidney transplant. He became a candidate uh, for a kidney transplant. So I pulled the trigger and uh, I felt comfortable with, you know, University of Georgia. Some people say, how, how can you do that? That's selfish. For Greg, the possibility of losing Tucker wasn't an option. He didn't care how many tens of thousands of dollars it would cost. So he traveled out of state to take part in a very specialized program. We don't realize how sick our animals are until you see an animal bounce back. Dr. Chad Schmidt is the head of the cat kidney transplant program at the University of Georgia's Veterinary Teaching Hospital, a one of its kind around the globe. One particular thing about cats is that they are so good at hiding their disease. So a lot of times cats won't start showing signs of illness and owners won't pick up on signs of illness until it's quite advanced. And so that's one challenge we face in these animals is trying to work with those very sick animals. Schmidt is one of only a handful of surgeons who performs kidney transplants on cats. We are one of two active programs in the country. We get our patients from all over the country and sometimes all over the world. The advantage here is that there's such a quality team of specialists in all different fields. It's an amazing surgery group, but you also have amazing anesthesiologists and amazing critical care people. And so there's this critical mass here that really enables us to give the most high quality care. Across the U.S., there has been a growing demand for advanced care for domestic pets, mostly because pet ownership in the U.S. has increased significantly over the last 30 years. As of this year, 66% of U.S. households, that's 86.9 million homes, own a pet. Millennials make up the largest percentage of current pet owners at 33%. It's considered uh, absolutely normal behavior for people to love their animals, 
spend whatever it takes to fix their animals when they get sick. You have to go back to the fact that for many people, these animals are like their kids. Sometimes it only buys the cat an extra year or so of life. But even so, for, for a cat of limited lifespan, a year is quite a long time, and it means a lot to the owner. 76% of cat owners said they considered their pets to be a member of the family, and that could lead to increased expenses. Just last year, Americans spent a whopping $136.8 billion on their pets. How much did this cost? Um, originally, uh, we're going back five and a half years ago. I, I, I want to say right around eighteen, nineteen thousand. Eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the cost of the surgery at the University of Georgia is around twenty thousand dollars for both the recipient and the donor. There are a lot of ongoing costs too. Um, I think owners can expect to spend anywhere between fifteen to four thousand dollars a year on medication and tests and veterinary visits. At the heart of the surgeries here at the University of Georgia, a hidden silver lining for those who go through with the surgery, saving the life of another cat. We take donor cats from a variety of places. Um, we've had donor cats be cats owned by the recipient family. We've had donor cats be cats owned by the recipient's veterinarian. Importantly, the donor cats are always adopted by the family of the recipient. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, they go on and live a, a normal life afterwards. Were you totally on board with the concept of a donor cat giving Tucker the yeah. kidney and then you adopting this donor cat? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that was, uh, I think part of that was uh, the exciting part is it's like, you know, having a baby, you don't know what you're coming home with. Charlie himself was uh, a research cat. Um, so as I say, you know, we saved his life too. Um, so, you know, I brought home one cat and we brought home, a, you know, a Tucker and we brought home another cat um, that we saved his life and gave him a chance at life as well. But some have ethical questions about the program. One of the ethical concerns, of course, is that there's a donor cat involved. And um, those donor cats don't, like, come along and say, yes, yeah, please take my kidney. The argument that is used is that most of those donor cats are coming from shelters. They might not have found a home. They might have been euthanized in the shelter. So donating a kidney to another cat is preferable to that, especially if the, the recipient household of that new kidney or that kidney is willing to adopt the donor. Did you wonder, is this ethical for this cat who can't technically really consent yeah. to give the kidney to Tucker? Yeah. Like, You know, I, I did what I felt. I've given this guy, you know, Tucker, a chance at a normal life. I felt that if a cat is scheduled to be euthanized and, yeah, you're taking a kidney away from him, you're still giving that cat an opportunity to live a life as well. Now, opinions, everybody has an opinion. Um, a lot of people are for it, a lot of people are against it, um, a lot of people think it's cruel, you know, a lot of people think it's the greatest thing. Um, so at the end of the day, it was my decision. I did what I felt was right. Tucker got a second chance, while donor cat Charlie found a forever home. So if Tucker did not get the kidney transplant, he would have died? He would have, yes, he would have died. He was on his last legs. Before you decided to get the surgery, I mean, what did Tucker mean to you? He was my family. Come on, Tucker. And here in Tennessee, Five years later, Tucker is thriving. In the beginning, do you think Tucker knew that Charlie played a role in saving his life? I don't know if they're able to pick up on that, but you know, they definitely have a bond. Um, you know, the bond that Charlie has with Tucker versus Charlie with Slash. What do the next few years look like for those two? I wish I had a crystal ball. Tucker uh, now, uh, like his creatinine level is starting to creep up um, as he's an older cat. Come here, talk. come on. It's up to him. His primary doctor now, you know, so we're treating him for older, you know, cat diseases. Charlie, he's young. He should, you know, live another, you know, you know, five years, ten years, who knows. Our thanks to Jacqueline Lee, and we still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, our very own Robin Roberts tells us about the love between her and her fiancé. But next, we're talking about your relationship. Is it love, or are you being played? We're going to let you know what one study says about the average time it takes for someone to profess their love. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is an unbelievable story. She was so excited. It was going to be a beautiful wedding. 911. Oh, my God. I don't think he's alive. Molly Watson's body was found. Wearing her engagement ring. I never would have thought that I would have been going to her funeral that next week. They've got to break the bad news to Molly's fiance. This is a story about a man who was living a double life. There's one piece of smoking gun evidence. It's not a gun, it's a cell phone. 2020, Friday night on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This this is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The glitch that some hope made them rich, those controversial buoys in Texas are actually in Mexico, and New York City becomes the latest place to ban TikTok on government devices. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Morning, Good Hue, Minnesota is scrambling. The entire police force is resigning, leaving the city's roughly 1,500 residents in law enforcement limbo. The main reason for the officers leaving? Disputes over their pay. The Good Hue police chief, who resigned late last week, had previously requested higher pay for his officers and better recruitment efforts. Police departments nationwide are facing a vicious cycle of retirement, resignations, and fewer hires. A survey released in April indicated that while police Police departments are recruiting more officers compared to 2020. Departments saw 47% more resignations and 19% more retirements in 2022 compared to 2019. And a whole lot of people in Ireland are trying to use a glitch to get rich. The Bank of Ireland says a computer problem let people withdraw large amounts of cash even beyond what they had in their accounts. The bank says it kept track of everything. The money everyone took will be deducted from their accounts. 
R&B star Usher unveiled the music video for his song Boyfriend featuring Kiki Palmer. Somebody say that your boyfriend's looking for me. Ooh, that's cool. The new video shows Palmer singing and getting ready for what seems to be a girl's night out. She soon meets up with Usher at a casino where a dance routine breaks out. The music video collaboration comes after a viral video of Palmer dancing with Usher during a performance at his Las Vegas residency prompted criticism from Darius Jackson, the father of Palmer's son. Palmer has not yet addressed the controversy publicly. New York City is banning TikTok on city-owned government devices after city officials determined the social media app poses a threat to the city's cybersecurity. The city is the latest government entity to ban the popular app. New York State banned the app on state-owned devices in 2020. And in May, Montana took it one step further, banning the app within the entire state. A survey by the International Boundary and Water Commission found the line of buoys intended to prevent illegal river crossings into the United States lies mostly in Mexico. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has defended the placement of the thousand-foot line of impassable buoys, but has not commented on the finding that 79% of the barrier was anchored on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. The buoys are part of Abbott's multi-billion dollar border security plan. Mohammed Hashim is a Melvindale police officer. He's only been on the job three months and already had a rescue he'll never forget near his home in Dearborn. Just bolted over there. Hashim didn't waste any time. He says his training from the Oakland Police Academy kicked in as he ran down the sidewalk, his brother following to where a toddler was on the ground. The child's mother and neighbors crying out for help when Hashim rushed to the little boy who was unresponsive. Hashim says he began delivering blows to the child's back. And thankfully, the two-year-old's dad says he's doing good and he's just thankful to his neighbor. Welcome back. Tonight we are looking at those three big words. I love you. Who says them first? When do you say them? And believe it or not, somebody actually studied it, and we have these findings by the numbers. It turns out, believe it or not, men are the quickest to say the words, I love you. They average, on average, they'll do it in 107 days into the relationship, about three and a half months. Women tend to give it a little bit longer. They utter those words 122 days on average, about four months in. And saying it takes some lead time, of course. Men said they started to think about saying the words 69 days into a relationship, women tended to begin pondering the words after 77 days. Now, as for the next big relationship words, researchers found people take one to two years to propose marriage. The number crunchers at Aberte University in Scotland reviewed survey responses from 3,109 volunteers across seven countries to gain these insights on confessions of love in heterosexual relationships. And the big takeaway is that around the world, does appear love is universal. And we have much more ahead here on Prime. Our Rebecca Jarvis brings us the story of the OC star who sounded the alarm over cryptocurrency and a child in danger and the hero officer who runs to save him. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. When FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried spoke with officials, investors, and celebrities, he was able to get billions invested into his burgeoning crypto exchange. But for every person who bought into what Bankman-Fried was selling, not everybody was buying in. Even enter actor and crypto skeptic Ben McKenzie. He saw past the sell, and he has now testified before Congress, and he's sounding the alarm for amateur traders everywhere. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis sat down with the former OC star and brings us that report. You might recognize Ben McKenzie as Ryan Atwood from the OC. Who are you? Whoever you want me to be. Or as James Gordon in the superhero crime drama Gotham. When I was about your age, drunk driver hit our car. Killed my dad. But lately, he's taken on a new role, Crypto Skeptic. The actor turned author recently published his debut book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud, detailing his investigation into the digital currency and his warning to consumers. I'm sure there are going to be a few people who say, how did that guy from the OC end up writing a book about crypto? Yeah, trust me. I mean, I feel the same way. <laughs> what am I doing here? It's a good question. Uh, I like to say that easy money is about cryptocurrency, but it's, it's really about money and it's about lying. And I know about money from a degree in econ and from making a little bit of it in showbiz, but I know about lying because I'm an actor and I do it for a living. Um, <laughs> and so when these cryptocurrencies were calling themselves currencies and all these guys were hawking this stuff, I was initially drawn in, but then I couldn't understand them. And I thought, this seems really sketchy. I just went further and further down and cryptocurrency was everywhere. And some of the most famous people in the world were selling it, but it didn't make sense economically. And if I was right, then it was gonna hurt a lot of people. And uh, I felt like I had a duty to speak out. Mackenzie's interest in the topic started during the pandemic, when he, like many others, found himself with a lot of extra time on his hands. And then he had an epiphany while reading his daughter a bedtime story. I was really debating at that point whether it was worth me speaking up about this. Who am I to call out this supposedly multi-trillion dollar industry? But I'm reading my daughter, The Emperor's New Clothes, and two things stuck with me. The first is, the genius of the con is just, a, it's just an appeal to ego. You know, only the smartest people can perceive the imaginary clothes. So adult after adult is tricked into believing the con for the simplest reason of all. They don't want to look stupid. The second thing is the emperor is gallivanting through town naked. It's a child who calls out the lie. The only one brave enough to speak truth is someone who doesn't know he's being brave. 
He's simply telling the truth. Well, it's hard not to see myself as that child. Who was I to call it out? And yet, maybe I was right. And what a story that would be. Mackenzie teamed up with journalist Jacob Silverman, and the two began their investigation, publishing articles in Slate, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and more, while interviewing some of the biggest names in cryptocurrency, like FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed, now accused of fraud, facing up to 115 years in prison. He has pleaded not guilty. What was that conversation like? Bizarre. We requested an interview. He agreed almost immediately. So we ended up in a Manhattan hotel room uh, in July of last year, well before you know he was charged with crimes. Um, and a lot of red flags for fraud were popping up. Things didn't add up. And I kept asking him to explain it to me in a way that made sense. And we never got there. It was like punching against air. It was very strange. Um, one of the most surreal hours of my life. How did you feel when you walked away from that conversation? I didn't know what to feel. I felt uneasy. At the time, Sam Bankman Fried was being called the JP Morgan of crypto. Um, so he was the purported head of this supposedly multi trillion dollar industry. And yet, when I talked to him, I found his answers deeply unsatisfying. And the strangest thing to me was that he wanted me to like him. What gave you that impression that he wanted you to like him? His behavior, the way he would reach out. He would say things like, I want to keep you from reporting on things that won't age well. Mm. Like, I'm going to protect you, mm. lead you the right way. He said to me at one point over DM, I understand that you're skeptical of crypto, but you can't be 100% skeptical. That can't be the right number. Which... I can understand the rationale there, but I didn't quite understand what he was trying to get out of me. He just wants that little piece of doubt. A little room. Mackenzie was eventually invited to testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee at the end of 2022 following the collapse of FTX and just days after Bankman Freed's arrest. The demise of FTX and Alameda represent the most spectacular corporate downfall since Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme imploded in the wake of the great financial crisis. So how do you cram for that? Well, speaking, you only have five minutes. And look, I mean, you know, I had to, <laughs> I'm a performer, so I needed to know what I was gonna say, I needed to hit my marks, and I needed to convey a clean and clear and compelling message. And so I ended up saying, I want the American people to know that although the stories of cryptocurrency are very compelling, the truth is very ugly. In my opinion, the cryptocurrency industry represents the largest Ponzi scheme in history. In fact, by the time the dust settles, crypto may well represent a fraud at least 10 times bigger than Madoff. Did you ever second guess your own thesis? Oh my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> you would have to have a major ego to think that, hey, I think I might have stumbled on the, one of the largest frauds in history, um, but everybody else doesn't seem to think that, but uh, surely I'm right. I mean, yeah, oh, absolutely, I question myself. I mean, I still have to check myself all the time. Um, what's wonderful about the crypto skeptics is that's what we do. We challenge each other. Thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that report. You've seen him on the Netflix film Always Be My Maybe and the hit series Fresh Off the Boat. Today, he joins us as the director of the film Shortcomings, a comedic drama set in Berkeley, California, following three characters as they navigate love, friendship, and connection. Take a look. It only seems like an amazing opportunity because it's in New York. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I wanted to do it. Trust me, New York is overrated. It's so gentrified now. How many times have you even been there? Are we counting layovers? No. That's amazing. Randall Park, thanks so much for being here today. How you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Trevor? I'm doing great. We know that you are very well-known and well-liked in front of the camera. What made you step behind at this time, and how'd you like it? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, it was it was this story. Uh, it was the uh, based on a graphic novel that I had read back in 2007, and, and the story just stuck with me for all these years. So, so it was something that I, I always wanted to make into a movie. And uh, uh, I just really had a great time directing it. It, it felt very, uh, it was very fun and felt, felt pretty natural to me. So, so I, I, I loved it and, and definitely want to do it again. 
We see the cover of that graphic novel actually framed behind you, so clearly you were a fan of it. Uh, I am That's curious. Right. I, I would imagine adapting a graphic novel is going to be a unique experience because there's already pictures in the source material. I mean, how did that influence your directorial decisions? Um, well, it, it was something I tried not to let influence me too much, like the actual visuals in the graphic novel. Uh, I wanted it to, and Adrian Tomina, who wrote the graphic novel, uh, uh, wrote our screenplay. We both wanted it to uh, very much stand stand on its own as a movie. So, so uh, uh, you know, that was that was the aim. But you know, I was again such a fan of the work that that it, it definitely you know makes its way into the movie as well. A lot of a lot of those panels and a lot of the uh, the, the look and feel of it is definitely uh, uh, in the movie. The, this story has been described as, and this is a quote, the best account ever of Asian male angst. Is that something you felt you could relate to and you wanted to portray on screen? <laughs> Yeah, I think that there, there is a degree of uh, relatability to the character, the main character for me. Uh, you know, he's he's a very flawed, complicated uh, character. And uh, and I saw a lot of myself, particularly when I was younger uh, uh, in him. So 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 getting it out into the world uh, felt felt pretty cathartic for me in some ways. You made a really interesting point in another interview promoting this movie, basically saying that you feel like Hollywood studios take the wrong lessons away from successful films. You referenced Barbie, saying that studios yeah. are their their takeaway from Barbie's success is we should make more movies about toys rather than stories from and by and about women. I'm sure goal yeah. 1A with your movie is you want it to succeed, but are there larger lessons or messages that you would like Hollywood to take away from what you've made here? Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately I feel like things work and resonate when they are, uh, you know, creative expressions of people. And, uh, uh, and, and also when they're made for uh, an audience that, that wants to be served. And I feel like the success of Barbie, you know, a, a great deal of it lies in, in just the genius of Greta Gerwig and, and the fact that you have an underserved audience that really wants to, to see something like, like Barbie. And, and, uh, and I feel like that, to me, that's like the takeaway. It's like, uh, it's like the, the movie Get Out. It's like, I, you know, I, don't, I didn't watch that and think, ooh, I want to see another movie about a big house, you know? <laughs> it's like... I, it's like, no, I want to see a, a, another movie by Jordan Peele, you right. know, uh, expressing himself and 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 uh, being creative. And, and so, yeah, that to me, that's the you know, I'm, I mean, I'm no expert, but that's that's uh, that's my guess as to why these things are so successful. Right. Compelling source matter rather than whatever larger IP we could pull from here. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned about your film. Every character here is flawed. Why was that so important in telling this story? Uh, because I am so flawed, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we all are. And uh, I think this movie is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's really about personal growth and about looking in, inwards and, 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 you know, and, and changing and growing and, and becoming a better person. And that, that's what our uh, protagonist is up against. And, and, and by the end, he, you know, he, he, he finds himself in a place where he, he really has to look inward. And I, I think that's the, the main uh, takeaway of the movie and, and why it was important for me to tell. Well, Randall, you're appearing here as a director and decidedly not as an actor or a writer as sag after the Writers Guild are still on strike. What outcomes are you hoping to see those strikes progress? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm hoping that uh, the WGA and, and sag after I hope we, we, we get what, we, what we're asking for, uh, or at the very least come to a, a sensible resolution, and uh, hopefully sooner than later. But I have no idea how, you know, how much longer this will take. But uh, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're in it for the long haul if need be. Mm -hmm. All right, Randall Park, thank you so much for being here. The movie's fantastic. It's called Shortcomings, and um, it is out in theaters now. Thanks so much, Randall. Thank you, Trevor.
And finally tonight, it's wedding season, and our very own Robin Roberts is about to get married. So today on Good Morning America, the GMA anchor celebrated with her fiance, Amber Lane. They had a bachelorette party ahead of their upcoming wedding. The couple is strolling down memory lane, recounting how they met and fell in love. When you say you're going to get married on Good Morning America, <laughs> you better set a date. It's finally happening, and it felt great. We had talked about marriage off and on during the course of our relationship, but after the lockdown, we were like, you ready? Let's do this. Let's get married. There's this little restaurant, and it's just our little spot, and we get a little calamari. And so we took the calamari rings and we slipped them on each other's fingers and we just, we proposed to one another. The backstory of how Robin and I met goes a little bit like this. It was 18 years ago. She had a friend, I had a friend, they both set us up. Alex and Bert were like, enough, you guys are gonna meet. I remember just walking up and oh, she was just beautiful. And she took my breath away and she still does. I like it a little butterflies when I think about it. There was just a gentleness to her. The signals were eye contact, lots of smiling, and it just flowed really, really nicely. Robin kind of like looked over and was like, would you like to join me for dinner to Amber? And that was not in the plan. And that's when I knew, okay, yay, it's working. I had just become the co-anchor with Charlie Diane just a short time before that. And she was working not far from our studio. She would purposely walk by. Robin would walk over to the windows and she'd wave and we would time it. And just watch her as she continued to walk on to work. Hi. Go like, hey. We'd only been dating not even two years when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. She could have bailed early on in the relationship. No one would have blamed her. Ooh, for better, for worse. It has not always been um, a bed of roses. There have been some thorns. We face so many challenges with Katrina, the passing of her mother, Robin's illnesses. And then for Amber to be diagnosed, she lost her father right at the beginning of COVID in 2020. We w went through couples counseling. And what I really love about us is that we know our love is real. We know there have been times we've had to not just fight for our lives, but fight for our love. We really early on learned how to become a partnership and work together and truly, truly trust one another. And to have someone by your side like that is a gift. What I really appreciate most is that each one of us saved the best for last. And that is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thank you for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, we bring you the latest update in the blindside family fallout, plus the growing death toll after that blast in the Dominican Republic. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live.
is the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Trevor Alt in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the recovery efforts on Maui. As the community asks questions over the devastation and sues the power companies, they say help spur those deadly wildfires, despite the official cause remaining undetermined. Plus, the sudden court decision that could endanger the access to medical abortion pills for millions of women across the country and in search of a tomb or with National Geographic explorer Mark Sinnott as he ventures all the way to the Arctic. We begin with the horror on Maui. As the death toll surpasses 100, the desperate search for the missing carries on as the wildfires become the deadliest natural disaster in Hawaii's history. Governor Josh Green says about 35% of the burned area has now been searched with cadaver dogs. Officials warn the death toll is still expected to rise. The first fire reported on Maui may have been caused by damaged power lines. That's according to the CEO of the power monitoring company, Whisker Labs. For the first time, we're seeing footage of what's believed to be the start of that fire. That surveillance video showing that spark, a flash, and then a down power line. Our Whit Johnson starts us off tonight once again on the island of Maui. Tonight, for the first time, we're seeing video of what could be an early trigger in the devastating Maui wildfires. You can hear a witness describe a flash that could be a tree falling on a power line. It's windy, and then... There's a flash, and I think that's when a tree is falling on a power line. One expert saying those videos taken inland from Lahaina show the flames spreading and may be the first evidence of downed power lines igniting a fire. We've got that video of that kind of explosion, that arc flash, and we've got 10 sensors in that community that show a very sharp drop in electrical voltage at precisely that same time. Power line just went down. And early Tuesday morning in Lahaina, Shane True using a garden hose to battle a fire that he says appears to have been caused by a down power line. That whole place was just engulfed. Oh. Authorities declaring that brush fire under control around 10 a.m., but then lost control of the flames hours later when the winds caused a flare-up to spread. By 5 p.m., Lahaina's historic front street up in flames. The utility saying they are still investigating what triggered the fire, adding the cause has not been determined. For the first time, FEMA escorting us into the heart of the devastation. This is our first trip into Lahaina to see it firsthand. 
what was once historic Lahaina town, now unrecognizable. People described the flaming embers raining down from the sky, and they only had a few seconds to get out. And many of them, their only escape was come right out here to the ocean and jump into the water. Rubble still smoldering. Pieces of buildings, boats in the harbor, life seemingly frozen in time. 20 search dogs now on the ground, 20 more expected in the coming days. When you look around, is there ever a moment when the emotion gets to you? When I'm done. No. Uh, when, I, when I go home, it might sink in a bit, but no, I got, I got a job to do. We'll, we'll take care of it. With Johnson on the ground for us once again on Maui, thank you. Next tonight to the Georgia election interference case against former President Trump and his 18 alleged co-defendants, the district attorney has now proposed dates for the arraignment and the trial, further complicating Trump's already busy legal calendar as he is still campaigning for re-election. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is in Atlanta with the details. With all eyes now set on Georgia, where Donald Trump and 18 alleged co-conspirators have less than 10 days now to show up to face charges, tonight Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis has now revealed when she wants the trial to begin. The DA asking the judge to set March 4th, right in the middle of the campaign and potentially conflicting with other trials. Special Counsel Jack Smith has asked a federal judge in Washington, D.C. to start that trial on January 2nd. But in Georgia, it will be different. Trump and the 18 alleged co-conspirators will likely have to show up at the county jail, where the sheriff has indicated they're ready, expected to be fingerprinted and get their mugshots taken. The sheriff saying defendants can turn themselves in at any time. The jail is open 24-7. The former president's ex-lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who famously used racketeering laws to go after mob bosses in New York, now facing 13 criminal counts in a case using the same kind of statute. Tonight, Giuliani says he's preparing to turn himself in. Well, I'll pick a day next week, try to work out the conditions of bail, because there has to be bail, I imagine. Part of the case against Giuliani includes personal attacks on two poll workers that were not true, accusing them of stealing ballots. Quite obviously, surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. Tonight, Giuliani saying he's ready to defend himself. I'm indicted for being his lawyer. I never thought I'd ever get indicted for being a lawyer. Surrendering to the sheriff at the county jail is just the first step in a process that will likely be far different from what we've seen before. In Georgia, there are cameras in court, which means Trump and the other defendants could be seen there often during a presidential campaign. And after they're booked, Trump and his co-defendants will have to appear before a judge to be arraigned and enter pleas. The district attorney today saying she expects that to happen the week of September 5th. And will Trump and the other defendants be tried together? The prosecutor already making that clear. Do I intend to try the 19 defendants in this indictment together? Yes. On social media, Trump attacking the DA and falsely claiming he won Georgia, even as Georgia's popular Republican Governor Brian Kemp says the 2020 election was not stolen, Trump lost. Aaron Katursky, thank you. And next tonight, we're tracking severe storms across several states with damaging winds, large hail, and possible tornadoes. Of course, this comes after deadly storms hit the east overnight. Our Rob Marciano is here to time it all out for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Trevor. Yeah, the storms are firing up across the upper Midwest, right along the Canadian border, and they could bring some damaging winds to places like Duluth, maybe Rochester, Minneapolis, into Wisconsin as we progress through the after early and late evening hours. And we could see, a, as you mentioned, damaging winds and a brief tornado. The heat's the other thing that we're watching, and that's spreading uh, again, and holding strong across the Pacific Northwest, where temperatures are well up and over 100 degrees in places like Portland. And this is dangerous heat for them, cooling a few degrees, but still record highs are possible. And look at this for the first time since we've been keeping records, the Gulf of Mexico average temperature, 88 degrees. That is way above average, a direct link to climate change, and not a good thing as we head into the heart of hurricane season because now our computer models are saying the western Gulf is an area we need to watch heading into next week. Uh, Trevor. Rob, while we have you, let's talk about another area that I think maybe we need to be watching, Antarctica. I'm hearing that they're in uncharted territory with how little ice there is there. Is that something we need to be paying attention to? What's going on down there? Absolutely, and this uh, also has a direct link to climate change. Uh, we're in the heart of summer, they're in the heart of their winter, so that's when the ice, the sea ice around Antarctica grows, and we're looking at an area now that is 1.5 uh, million 
square kilometers below the average. So that is not a good thing. We've got a couple of more months before we really basically peak, but it does look like this year is once again going to be a record low for sea ice in the Antarctic. Trevor. Rob Marciano for us. Rob, thank you. Next tonight, terrifying moments in the sky after flames began shooting out of a flight. ABC's Victor Okendo brings us that story and has details about another mid-air emergency. Keep your eyes on the right wing of that plane flying over Houston. Shortly after takeoff, flames shooting out from the engine of the Southwest jet bound for Cancun. With one engine down, they were forced to turn around, making an emergency landing at Houston's Hobby Airport Tuesday night. 307, you clear for the alley from way for approach. 307, you still have uh, one engine shut down, is that correct? The plane landing safely. The airline tonight saying the jet experienced a mechanical issue shortly after takeoff and was taken out of service for review. And in Miami, another scare in the skies. A pilot suffering a medical emergency in the middle of a LATAM Airlines flight from Miami to Santiago, Chile, Monday. There were three pilots on board when the flight diverted to Panama. The airline saying the crew tried saving the pilot's life mid-flight. Medical teams standing by when the plane landed, but the pilot died. Our thanks to Victor Okendo for that. Next tonight, an update in the controversy surrounding the family and the football star that inspired the movie The Blind Side. Former NFL player Michael Orr claims in a lawsuit that a husband and wife depicted in the award-winning film never actually adopted him and kept money from the movie that was rightfully his. Well, now the husband and wife say they want to end the conservatorship at the center of this dispute. Here's Ariel Reshef. Tony, here's your quarterback, all right? You protect his blind side. When you look at him, you think of me. Tonight, attorneys for the Tui family, made famous in the movie The Blind Side, firing back against allegations they exploited former NFL star Michael Orr for financial gain. This was somebody they treated as a son who has made public these allegations that are just ludicrous. The family disputing Orr's claims that he recently learned he had been tricked into signing a document making them his legal conservators after they took him in when he was a homeless teenage football player. The two, we say, Orr knew about the arrangement and even wrote about it in his own book years ago. Mr. Tui sold his company for $220 million. He didn't need Mr. Orr's money. The Tui's claim money from the movie was split evenly among the family and Orr, each getting $100,000, but that Orr threatened to plant a negative story about them in the press unless they paid him $15 million. We're not going to be strong on. We haven't done anything. Uh, we're not going to be extorted. That's Ariel Reshef reporting. Next tonight, a major legal victory for a newspaper raided by local authorities over a story the paper says it never published. One of the co-owners co of the paper, a 98-year-old woman, died just one day after the raid, and her family says it was caused by the stress from that raid. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, a legal victory for this small-town Kansas newspaper after this police raid that made national headlines. Marion police reading a reporter her rights, snapping photographs, and taking away computers as they seized items from the newsroom of the Marion County record. Part of what they said was an investigation into how the paper obtained and handled documents about a local business owner. But Eric Meyer, who co-owns the paper, said they never published the article and that they were falsely accused of illegally obtaining information. Meyer says his 98-year-old mother and co-owner, whose home was also raided Friday, died on Saturday, one day after the raid, saying she was too stressed to sleep or eat. How dare they take the last day of her life and make her filled with fear and anger. But today, a local prosecutor reviewing the case saying there was insufficient evidence to support that search warrant and that all of the devices and materials seized must be returned. Alex Perez, thank you. And also some good news tonight after doctors in New York City have announced a medical breakthrough, a genetically modified animal kidney transplanted into a human recipient continues to see success weeks after the procedure. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the details. 
Tonight, a major medical breakthrough, bringing us one step closer to using animal organs in humans. Surgeons at NYU Langone announcing they have transplanted a pig kidney into a brain dead patient. And for the first time, that kidney, genetically modified to better match a human body, has functioned for more than a month without the body rejecting it. The pig kidney appears to replace all of the important tasks that the human kidney manages. The sister of that patient, 57 year old Maurice Mo Miller, saying this groundbreaking study is what her brother would have wanted. He would be proud of the fact that in the tragedy of his death, his legacy will be helping many people live. The hope is that one day pig kidneys could ease a dire shortage of organs. More than 100,000 Americans are waiting for an organ, but each year only about a third will get one. 17 people die each day waiting. At the end of the day, um, we have to think about all the people who are dying right now because we don't have enough organs. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Also tonight, a new court decision concerning a widely used abortion drug, Mifepristone. It's setting the stage for a battle that could go all the way up to the Supreme Court. A federal appeals court today sided with the Texas judge, agreeing Mifepristone should be more tightly regulated, deciding the FDA went too far when it approved the drug more than 20 years ago. The appeals court says for now, though, it will not restrict how women access the drug, as this does potentially go to the Supreme court. And we still have much more to get to. Coming up, we're going to bring you the sweet story of two siblings who were living under the same roof without knowing they shared DNA. But next, we're going to get lost in the Arctic with a Nat Geo explorer in search of a tomb. Whenever news breaks, the crushing families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Russian drones again pounded grain silos and warehouses along the Danube River in Ukraine overnight. President Zelensky said there's now been seven massive Russian attacks on grain shipment facilities since Moscow abandoned the deal, allowing Ukraine to export grain. The U.S. also condemned the attacks today, saying President Putin is threatening global food security. The death toll from Monday's huge explosion in the Dominican Republic continues to grow. Officials have now confirmed 25 deaths, even as crews continue to search for the missing, and hundreds of firefighters are still trying to extinguish flames in four of the nine buildings that caught fire in the blast. 
The source of the explosion has not yet been identified. And the United Nations Security Council today condemned Azerbaijan for its nine-month blockade of the breakaway Nagorno-Karabakh region. They said the country must allow humanitarian supplies into the majority ethnic Armenian area. Residents there say food, fuel, medicine, and other essential supplies are critically low. The new National Geographic documentary special, Explorer, Lost in the Arctic, follows Nat Geo explorer, rock climber, and author Mark Sinnott and a team of local explorers as they search for the tomb of a legendary ship captain and solve one of history's greatest seafaring mysteries, the disappearance of Sir John Franklin. It sounds like it's out of Indiana Jones, but it's real. In 1845, Sir John Franklin set off from England with two ships and 129 men in hopes of being the first to navigate the Northwest Passage. But Franklin's ships vanished without a trace, sparking decades of expeditions in search of them. Let's take a look. Crossing the maze of icebergs in Baffin Bay was the first real test Franklin and his men faced on their voyage into the unknown. This is part of the reason why I wanted to sail to King William Island, to be faced with some of the same decision points that Franklin was 175 years ago. Compelling. Joining us now, Mark Sinnott. Thanks so much for being here, Mark. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You know, I think a lot of people would say, if this is a passageway where boats disappeared, perhaps I shouldn't take a boat down it. But it compelled you to do just that. Why is that? Well, I, I guess I just love going on adventures. That's kind of what I've been doing for my, for my whole life. And uh, I'm just one of those people where I get an idea, certain ones, they just get under my, my skin and that I cannot stop thinking about them. The Northwest Passage uh, was kind of like that. I mean, this is a mystery that goes back to 1845. And it's puzzled historians for decades who haven't been able to figure it out. Where do you even start with a mystery like this? You know, I think if if uh, if you were just going to sort of follow this the standard story that was put together by, you know, European explorers who tried to figure out what happened to Franklin, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of point in what we did. We approached it from a different perspective, which was. The, the, the people who really know the story or knew the story about what happened to Franklin were the Inuit. They um, encountered Franklin. Um, they tried to help Franklin, according to their testimony. And it seemed to me like their testimony had never really been given its proper due, and a lot of it had kind of been dismissed. And so our approach almost this idea of like, what if you took all of the European knowledge and you set it aside and you just only listen to what the Inuit told you, where would that lead you? And the Inuit um, have a number of different accounts that talk about um, Franklin's tomb. And so that's what we were searching for, following the clues that they laid out. I think people have this vision in their head of what an adventure looks like as it plays out and you search for clues and there's a dirty and torn map that has a route that you're supposed to take. Did you actually uncover any historical artifacts or maps or anything like that? You know, one awesome thing about this trip is that we did find some artifacts. We're still vetting them to find out if they're authentic. I think there's a good chance that they are. We found a, uh, a brass steam fitting, uh, which may have been from the uh, engine on the Erebus, the Terror. We found um, a tent stake, which seems like it matches up with things that they had on the ship. And then we also found some um, iron pyrite, which was used as a fire starter back in Franklin's day. We had an Inuit member of our expedition who was from King William Island where we're doing the searching, and he said that he had never seen anything like that and that it was something that huh. the Inuit didn't use. The artifacts that we found support the theory um, that we have, again, based on the Inuit testimony about what we think uh, might have happened, which is very different from the, the standard story. Huh as history often unfolds in that capacity. Uh, I, I would love to ask Mark also, of course, we can't forget this is playing out largely in the Arctic. It's not the most hospitable place in the world. It is notoriously harsh and unpredictable. 
What kind of adaptations did you have to make on this trip to stay safe with you and your crew? Well, I mean, one of the uh, one of the things that really made this such a wild adventure was that my my boat, the Polar Sun, is really not an expedition vessel. But you know, as you can see in some of this footage, we got caught in the ice, and our hull wasn't really um, designed for that. So that's part of what made it sort of hair raising and. Even though the Arctic is melting and it's much easier to make it through the Northwest Passage now than it was in Franklin's day, there's still a lot of ice. And uh, we got caught in it for about nine days and had to fight really hard to uh, to save the ship. That was the part that I was referring to when I was talking about <laughs> how things got a little too real. I wanted to follow in Franklin's footsteps, but I didn't really want it. I didn't, I didn't want it to get yeah. that close to what they yeah. experienced. Not that last footstep. And I believe I also saw in that footage some seasickness too, Mark. It's good to know that even adventurers can get a little bit sick at sea. Mark Sinnott, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Of course. The National Geographic special Explorer Lost in the Arctic premieres August 24th on National Geographic. It will be available to stream the next day on Disney Plus and Hulu. And still to come, we have the incredible story of two siblings who had no idea just how deep their bond really is. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, an amazing discovery on New York's Staten Island. Two abandoned babies found years apart discovered their bond as siblings is even stronger than they could have imagined. Our Rhiannon and Allie has the story from our partner station, WABC. 19 years ago, Vicki Lynn Laffin was abandoned as a newborn at the Richmond University Medical Center in Staten Island, discovered bundled up by nurse Claudia Beadle. She was just laying there and I just scooped her up. Vicki was soon adopted by Angela and Dennis Laffin, but they did not know her backstory beyond being adopted. Walking in here was definitely emotional. It definitely felt a little overwhelming, but it was it was really nice to see kind of the, the place where I was left and see that Claudia was so great and took such good care of me. The Laffins are also parents to one biological son and one adopted son named Frank. Frank was discovered on the steps of a Staten Island daycare as a baby, two years before Vicky was even born. He too did not know his full backstory. They didn't know they were abandoned up until a couple of months ago because we never used the words abandoned, left behind, dumped. We, it's just not, you know, in our vocabulary. So Vicki and Frank decided to take DNA tests, hoping to discover more about their history. What they found instead? My brother had popped up as my full sibling, my biological brother. The two biological siblings. We were both found a year and a half apart and wound up in the same family. The odds are insane. Ain't that the truth? Our thanks to Rhiannon and Allie, an incredible story. And that's our show for tonight. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com.